city of some size and, and significance economically. John the Baptist was in prison by this time. And so Jesus is, interestingly enough, making his headquarters uh, in Galilee, in a prominent city in Galilee, under Herod's jurisdiction. But their paths never crossed, as we find out later, much, much later. Uh, although Herod had heard of him, and we saw the, the nobleman's son, the nobleman, we said, was somebody in Herod's administration. He either had a military function or a, uh, a political function, but he was, and it could mean that he was related to Herod as well, but it was someone currently uh, in the household of Herod. It's not clear when the call of disciples to be fishers of them fits chronologically. And there's been some debate upon that. It's in Luke 5 here, but some place it before Luke 4, which seems awkward um, that he would mention this call. But in this talk, talking about the life of Jesus, it's, it, it, it's not unusual that at some point um, he says, he, he talks about himself and the other disciples, and he interjects these uh, things. Um, because Mark seems to imply in his account that this was before the miracles that would take place on the Sabbath day in Capernaum. Uh, but it's worth notice that, that, that also that some people believe that Matthew and Mark's brief account of this call uh, may be actually a separate incident or separated by some time from this call to, with Peter and Andrew. Um, Mark indicates it was after the call to Peter and Andrew, but how far after? It all may have been minutes after or an hour or two after. The reason some people think it's a separate incident, or, or this incident was actually stretched out over several hours. It's, we, we can we look at this as only the short, brief facts that were given here, and says, well, that wouldn't have taken very long. But in, rea in, in reality, there was a whole sermon here, a teaching session that might have gone on for some time. And so this actually could have occurred over many hours, not just a few minutes. A minute. Um, but the reason some people think this was two separate incidences and it, uh, is that Matthew and Mark have the disciples fishing, and Luke's account says they finished fishing and were washing the nets. So that is a major difference that would indicate that it was, they were separate calls. Uh, and there are very various scenarios and sequences possible to harmonize these these three accounts. It may be that this account actually happened over some period of time, and and uh, uh, and, and and this is why they were fishing at first when he first comes upon them, but then they were finished fishing. They were washing their nets. And, and we find out also when we compare the accounts that there seems to be a disagreement. Luke kind of compacts the, the call to be fishers and then to all of them. And yet the other accounts seem to indicate that Jesus first of all gave it to the call to Peter to be fishers of men. And then later separately to James and John. Which again, he was on the boat with Peter. He may have said something, likely did say something, to Peter on the boat. And later when James and John came ashore in their boat separately, he told them he, he was going to make them fishers. Now, the bottom line is it's not extremely criti uh, uh, critical that we have an exact scenario. But the, the important thing is these accounts could be reconciled in any number of of ways. It's just like the resurrection. There are different accounts, Jesus appearing to different people, uh, and some of those people aren't mentioned in the other accounts. So how do you synchronize those accounts? There are different ways, and people have spent 
a lot of ink trying to do those. And, and, and it can be synchronized, but it's, it's not necessarily crucial. We shouldn't necessarily look at these. This is a problem, though. Well, in verse 1, we see that there are crowds following Jesus. This is one reason some people have trouble putting this in a chronology. They say, well, is this after? the? Would the crowds be because of the miracles? But some people say, no, I think this took place before those miracles because of, of the reference particularly of, of Mark. <coughs> but the crowds may have been just from the notoriety of Jesus from the healing of the nobleman's son. We were already uh, aware, made aware that Jesus, there was a lot of buzz, a lot of rumors about Jesus, and so now he, he was coming to Capernaum, where the nobleman's son had been healed, people would have been ready <coughs> to hear what he had to say, and they followed him, and even when he went to the Sea of Galilee, there were people following him, wanting to be taught. It's entirely possible that Jesus approached these men as they were fishing, and later when they failed to catch anything, and they were washing their nets. <coughs> People were arriving and asking Jesus to hear the word of God. That, that Luke picks up his narrative. Well, Jesus entered into one of the fishing boats and asked Simon to take it out a little bit from the land. And he taught the people from the fish. Something I, I haven't found in a commentary but makes perfect sense to me is that um, it, it seems awkward that he would pull away in a boat and teach them from a boat, but the acoustics would have been incredible. So if there was a large crowd, if you've ever been fishing uh, uh, on a, a mountain lake like a Lake Alpine, and people are going by in a boat quietly, a little trolling motor or something, and they're going by, you can hear every word they're saying because their, <laughs> their voices bounce off the water and, and reflect that sound to you. So the acoustics, if the water was calm and that there wasn't a wind, the acoustics would have been excellent and it would have acted almost like a, a, a loudspeaker. We're not told what the message was, but this was at sort of a, an interesting time in Jesus' life because he'd already con been confronted by the religious authorities in Jerusalem twice, once at his cleansing of the temple and once he was called a Sabbath breaker for healing the man at the pool of Bethesda, and then a blasphemer for making himself. So the lines were already drawn. And Jesus now is popular amongst the people, but those lines with the Jewish religious leaders have already been drawn. And the disciples who already believed in Jesus were now listening to this message of someone who had basically all already drawn a line in the sand. And so this was the kind of the context. So they were obviously friendly to Jesus' message, to say the least, and they already believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And now Jesus was controversial as well as popular. These four men mentioned in this account had been called earlier. And that would have involved a very real commitment on their part. Uh, and none of the disciples had repudiated that earlier call. Jesus had likely sent them to their homes and to their work for a time while he had that confrontation in uh, Jerusalem. So what's the difference about this call, sometimes called the second <coughs> call of the disciples? This call came in a very different religious context. Jesus was not just a teacher talking about repentance and the kingdom of God, which would have sounded very messianic. And John the Baptist's message wasn't all that controversial. Nobody disagreed with the need for repentance. Uh, but Jesus now had gone beyond that. Jesus had now openly confronted the religious leadership. He'd done it at the cleansing of the temple, and at the, after the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda, he had been called a Sabbath breaker, killed to death for that, and a blasphemer for making himself equal with God. So, now these disciples know this is not going to be a typical teacher-student relationship. 
Jesus is a very controversial individual. This is going to be a call to a whole new life that they couldn't even imagine. Their former occupations of fishing <coughs> offered here simile to the new one. And so Jesus used that. I'll make you fishers of men. Literally, that, that passage in Luke means you, you will catch men alive. The typical relationship of disciples to a rabbi was academic. You were you were a student to learn. You were to learn more about the, the scriptures and 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 the and how to be a religious leader and teacher yourself. But the disciples of Jesus were taught in order. They were taught and prepared for a life of activity and a life different than an academic. Uh, they had to undertake a work that was going to be their responsibility once Jesus was no longer with them. Uh, and that kind of commitment to this new type of discipleship required a familiarity with Jesus. It wasn't a leap of faith. Jesus had said, I've now drawn the hostility of the religious leadership. They think I'm worthy of uh, of guilt, and I want you to be my disciples now full time. It, uh, it was a, a difficult call. They understood what it implied, though. And when they followed Jesus at this point, they knew this was risky. But they already had the testimony of John that this was the one of whom he spoke. And John, however, was in prison. So this was quite a commitment to follow Jesus at this point. Because frankly, humanly speaking, things looked like they were going downhill for the whole kingdom of God thing. John was in prison. Jesus now was considered worthy of death by the religious leadership in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, I want you to follow me. Big commitment. So, the first to follow Jesus, Simon Peter... James and John were some the first to make this commitment. Now, the miracle that we see here was a miracle for the poor. A lot of the miracles of Jesus, as well as the miracles in the Old Testament as well, weren't seen by very many people. Sometimes they were only seen by one or two people. They were not for show because we're told already after Jesus' miracles, uh, the first time he went to Jerusalem to cleanse the temple, the people believed in him, but he wasn't really ready to commit to them. And it may have been they were just, they liked to show the miracles. But Jesus was sometimes reluctant. Then when he went to Nazareth and said, you want a miracle, I'm not going to give you one. So believing in miracles is one thing, because anybody wants, you know, a lot of people want to believe in miracles, and we see that a lot of fraud based upon the fact that people want to believe in miracles. Well, um, this miracle was for the benefit of these four. And I think the reason of that becomes apparent when we see um, where, where they stood. We're told that they had labored all night fishing and had caught nothing. You know, they had to wash and mend their nets. And so they must have been discouraged. I mean, their work had been unproductive. They were fishermen, and they caught nothing all night. And yet there was still work involved in mending their nets because it gets torn on the rocks and, and such. Um, it, if you've ever fished, it can be frustrating to, to fish and, and catch actually nothing because it's fun when you catch fish, but then after the fact when you spent the time fishing and you've caught nothing, you say, well, that was after all, that was a waste of time. You're always waiting for that adrenaline for when you catch the fish. But if it never comes, after the fact, you realize that was a terrible waste of effort. And here they're professional fishermen, and they wasted an entire night fishing. And probably the sun was up, it was getting warm, they figured the fish are going to go into deeper <coughs> water. We haven't caught them now. <coughs> There's no point trying anymore. They knew what they were doing and they figured it's it's no longer productive to keep at this, so they quit for the day. Now, previously they had already committed to Jesus as being the Messiah. 
They also knew he was a miracle worker. They had the testimony uh, of John. But something that, that had to be prominent in their thinking is that we're only fishermen. What are we supposed to do? We'll learn from Jesus. We believe in, in, in him. Um, what, what are we to, expected to do, though, with this discipleship? Um, Albert Edersheim said that uh, fishing was a big business because fish were a major part of the diet. And there's even a, 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 one of the gates, we're told, in Jerusalem was called the fish gate. So the fish trade was, was big. And it could be lucrative. And this was a, there were two families of fishermen here involved in, in this business. So these young men of prominent families may have seen themselves more as the supporters of, of John and then Jesus. Sort of like, you know, we can help you. We can uh, best help you perhaps by financing uh, your, your work as a, as a teacher. But they had no background as academic scholars. They had no formal religious training. Um, if we can contrast here the words of Jesus uh, to the people and their thoughts. Uh, here, they were listening to Jesus now as he was teaching the people from their own boat. And they were saying, this is wonderful. We agree with this. But we're only fishermen. What, what, why did John tell us to follow Jesus? And they may have been thinking, we can help him maybe financially a, a little bit. Maybe that's the reason we're, we're in this. But here they're fishing and they're catching absolutely nothing. What they're best at was totally unproductive that night. So these men were back at work, and Jesus asked their help to address the crowd. When he had finished speaking, he told Simon, I want you to take me out into deeper water with your nets, and I want you to cast your nets into the water. Andrew, the brother of Simon, was also likely in that same ship, and James and John were in a different ship, but apparently they were all perched together. <coughs> Simon obviously was not going to refuse Jesus, but he frankly told Jesus that the fishing wasn't very good. That it was past time. They'd obviously been out all night because they thought that's when their best chances of catching fish were, because the fish move into the shallower water. And yeah, they were in small ships in a large body of water. And they figured now the sun's up, it's getting warm, it's mid-morning or later, and there's, there's not as a very good likelihood that we'll be successful. Nevertheless, he did what Jesus said, and they, implying that there was someone other than Peter on the board, maybe several people, um, let down the net. So, so many fish were immediately in the nets that their newly mended nets, uh, nets uh, broke. And they couldn't haul the nets up into the, the ship, there were so many, and they were going to break if they tried, so obviously they had to kind of keep these fish suspended in the water in the net so <laughs> they wouldn't tear the net. And if the net tears bad enough, the fish just all go back into the water. Um, so they called over James and John to help them, and they filled both the ships so full that they were uh, close to being swamped. The response of Peter is in verse 8. Jesus had now come into his world of fishing, and Peter somehow knew that this, this, this miracle was intended for him. He believed Jesus was the Messiah, and Peter and the others could believe that, but they also believed that they couldn't do much more than believe. Yeah, we believe in your message, Jesus. We believe in who you are, but what do you want from a bunch of fishermen? Seriously. And Peter said, depart from me, for I'm a simple man, O Lord. And, you know, O Lord is saying, Master, I, there's nothing we can do to help you. And we don't even deserve this miracle you just did for us. And Jesus, Jesus had earlier called Simon Peter the Rock, and Peter probably, 
certainly didn't feel like a rock. We had no idea why Jesus had told him that. The answer of Jesus to Peter and the others is in verse 10. Fear not. From henceforth thou shalt catch men, or catch men alive. Matthew and Mark use the phrase, fishers of men. Jesus performed a miracle for these four men. And they're the only ones who saw this miracle. Well, there were some other servants, apparently, there too. At this point, uh, in his commentary on the life of Jesus, Alfred Uttershein says something interesting. Quote, it is not well to speak too much of the faith of men. With all the singleness of spiritual result, perhaps as yet rather impulsive, which it implied, they probably had not themselves full or adequate conception of what it really meant, unquote. In other words, their faith was in the fact that they were only simple fishermen. That's what they believed. Yes, they believed in who Jesus was, but... They're, they're, they had, Jesus had to go beyond what they were thinking and saying, what you are doing is fine, but I could even take what you're doing and make it so productive your boats will sink for all the fish. But I want you to go beyond that. I want to make you fishers of men. They were so overwhelmed with this power of this miracle and the call of Jesus, it wasn't about what we call faith. That is, believing in certain doctrinal things about Jesus, which are important. Um, they believed that Jesus could perform a miracle strictly for them and had performed a miracle for them to get their attention and then the call. They were still only fishermen, but now they're thinking, what are we supposed to say? No. See? Peter, Peter expressed the unworthiness he and the others felt. Faith hardly expresses it. All they knew that Jesus was the promised one, and that now, alone on the water, he had displayed his power for them, and had given them a call. When he later heard the story of Saul's conversion, Peter likely thought of this moment, when he was overawed by the power of God and had no opportunity no option but to respond positively. There's a reform doctrine called irresistible grace. And I think that's what we're seeing here. And, and that irresistible grace was set up by this miracle of Jesus. This is what Peter felt, this irresistible grace. You can call it faith, but they, they already had faith in who Jesus was. Doctrinally, they were on, on the same page as Jesus, and they agreed with him. But this, this miracle was a grace in their life. And then Jesus added to this miracle a call to them as I want you, I have a job for you. I'm going to make you fishers of men. Every possible part of Peter was self-consciously aware of his sin and, in, and inadequacy before Jesus. There was a place for such a, a, a humbling response to Jesus, but Jesus now wanted more than that. Jesus had a role for these men. First to learn, and later it would be to proclaim what they had heard and seen. So Jesus said first, fear not. Peter's, Peter's abject submission to Jesus was not rejected. It was, it was appropriate. But Jesus said, I want your relationship to me to go beyond your, your humble attitude. That, as proper as that was, that's not what I'm asking for you right now. I want you to follow me. And I'll make you fishers of men. The analogy to fishing broke down any reluctance the disciples had over their inadequacy to follow Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was saying, you know fishing. His miracle said, I can multiply your skills beyond your wildest dreams. And when I call you to be fishers of men, you can be sure that I can take care of any inadequacy you feel as simple fishermen. The, desire, the disciples had every reason to doubt their ability to help Jesus. They had every reason to doubt the, the, the success of going out midday and fishing where they had been unsuccessful all night. Jesus said, you want fish? I'll give you fish. 
But I want you to be fishers of men. And I can empower you to do that just like I can empower you to catch fish when you don't think you can. Mark tells us that Zebedee, the father of James and John, was also in the fishing business with these men, and that there were other hired servants. So the four men, Luke says, forsook all and followed Jesus. And we, again, we tend to think of things real simplistically, that they just left their nets there, abandoned them, <laughs> and, and just walked away. In reality, that commitment involved really a commitment in telling their father, Zebedee, saying, you're going to have to carry on this business without us, because we're going to be followers of Jesus. In fact, they're going to come back to the burning, and it's going to be their base of operations. So they just didn't turn and walk away from their nets and leave their nets and their boats to the elements. This was a, a self-conscious, a, a business decision. They said, you're going to have to carry on the family business without us, because we have chosen to follow Jesus. And... They already believed in Jesus, but they believed in Jesus as simple fishermen. Had Jesus called them in any way, they likely would have followed. But this miracle showed them these four fishermen what Jesus could do. And that if he could do this for them as fishermen, and he wanted them to catch men... They probably didn't know what that meant, but they knew that he could do it. And they weren't going to say no to Jesus. They were so overwhelmed by his power, now displayed specifically, <laughs> this is the first miracle that Jesus did just for the, his disciples. They, they now had the power of God on their side. They no longer had reason to doubt their adequacy. Let's pray. Our most good and gracious God.